Um, okay, so without any further ado, um, let's talk a little bit about force fields. Okay, I'll give you a brief introduction to force fields and um, and my and my research, which uh, is involved with force field optimization. Um, so there, there really is a very, uh, there's a vast range of molecular simulation methods. And in this OpenMM workshop, we are mainly concerned with running atomistic classical molecular mechanics using empirical force fields, right? But you can see that in the big picture, there's really a, a very wide range of ways to simulate atoms and molecules. Um, using, you can, um, you can use a very level of detail and run what are called coarse grain simulations in which the particles in your simulations don't represent atoms at all. They really just they really represent collections of atoms. So you, so an entire amino acid can be represented using one particle, and that allows you to simulate, say, entire viruses or, or even cells, but at a much lower level of detail. And if you go to a higher level of detail, you have methods that treat the that treat the electrons explicitly, like the Hartree-Fock method or density functional theory, which are all approximations to Schrodinger's equation, which can only be solved for systems that contain one electron. Okay. Um, and, and in general, the more physical detail you include into your simulation, the more costly the simulation is going to be. But more physical detail does not always mean a more accurate model, right? Because uh, there are many definitions for accuracy. And we are always searching for the simplest essential description of our system, because that is going to enable us to run rapid and accurate simulations. So that's kind of like our end goal in designing good force fields. OK, so these are the different types of interactions that are available in a typical force field. You have the stretching of harmonic bonds, um, uh, the bending of, at, of angles between three atoms, the rotation of a dihedral angle, and also interactions between um, non-bonded atoms, which usually take the form of an electrostatic interaction plus a Van der Waals interaction. As you can see, if this is a sodium ion and a chloride ion, they attract each other with an electrostatic interaction, and when they get close enough, they repel. And the accuracy of your simulation depends critically on your choice of the parameters, because there really is no underlying Schrodinger's, equ Schrodinger's equation to approximate, right? You can really write down any equation you want, and your simulation can do anything. If you want it to reflect reality, you better choose a good set of parameters. So what set of parameters do you choose? Um, there have been groups that have developed force fields for a very long time. There's a relatively small number of these groups, and they've published a number of force fields over the years. For example, the AMBER consortium has developed a series of uh, AMBER force fields that are like FF94, 96, 99, 03, and and 10, um, and there's also various modifications to the dihedral angles in FF99 that give you better protein structures. There's a generalized amber force field, which um, is more of a procedure that allows you to build, uh, to build a force field for any small molecule that is consistent with the rest of the amber force field. Okay, and that's just for amber. There's also, uh, there's OPLS and CHARM and amoeba. Um, and, and even though there's a relatively small number of research groups making these force fields, to you, when, um, when you're starting out on a research project, which one do you choose? You know, there's a lot of force fields for you to choose from. And the amount of validation in the literature is kind of limited, ex um, with the exception of a very small number of force fields that a lot of people run, like, a lot of simulations on. Similarly for water, there are many force fields that describe water. The most well-known ones are uh, TIP 3P, TIP 4P, and TIP 5P, where this stands for transferable intermolecular potential. And, um, and perhaps a little bit ironically, most of these protein force fields are developed in conjunction with the TIP 3P water model, which also happens to be probably the worst water model that I've listed on there. Uh, like, for example, when people have simulated the melting point and boiling point of TIP 3P water, they find that it melts at a minus 150 degrees Celsius and boils at night, uh, minus 90 degrees Celsius, which you know is not what water really does. Do you really want that interacting with your protein? You know, well, I'm not sure. Probably not. Um, so there's way too many force fields to choose from, and uh, um, and this is probably becoming a headache for a lot of people who are doing protein simulations. If your if your result doesn't agree with the experiment, this is a this is a possible source of error. Okay. Um, and, um, and it might lead some people um, to ask the question, 
can we create a force field that is best for our particular research project? I think there are three main steps to make to creating a force field. I mean, um, of course, force field development is very, very disciplined. Everyone does it a little bit differently, but probably most of probably most force field development approaches have these three main steps. The first is you choose a functional form. Okay, and um, I gave this amoeba slide. I gave the slide yesterday in my amoeba presentation, but the main reason why this slide is here is that there are different ways to describe the electrostatic interactions. For example, the amber force field just uses uh, point partial charges that are located on the atoms, whereas amoeba uses a much more complex description with a second order multipole expansion on each atom, plus putting a polarizable dipole on each of these atoms. Um, the amoeba description is more accurate, but it is also more costly. So it's really up to you um, to choose um, what, level of, what level of detail you want for the electrostatic description and all the other interactions. Okay, the second step is to choose a set of reference data. The reference data is the, uh, um, is the data that you want your force field to reproduce, and hopefully um, the reference data is very, uh, well, is something that can reflect reality. Um, for instance, you can choose your reference data to come from a high accuracy quantum mechanical calculation. Um, this is what a 2D potential energy scan of the dihedral angles of a molecule might look like. And when you scan these angles and you compute the energies using, say, a really high level theory like MP2 or CCSD or something, it might take you a few days, but you'll end up with a potential energy surface like this one that you would like your force field to be able to reproduce. You can also do something like compute the electrostatic potential from a quantum method on a molecular surface. Um, you can see I've uh, plotted the electrostatic potential on a density isosurface where I think blue is negative and red is positive, and you might want the charges in your force field to reproduce that. And that's how the RESP method works in the generalized amber force field. And, um, and why not have the force field also reproduce some, um, some measurements from experiment? Because that's what we're often trying to co uh, compare to experiment, and we're um, and maybe if we have a really good force field, we can try to predict experimental results, right? Um, so, you, so you can see that it's possible to do something like simulate an, M an NMR chemical shift with, um, with a molecular dynamic simulation, as long as you have a spectroscopic model that takes your simulation trajectory to the predicted spectra. And this grid here has various protein force fields on the x-axis and various water models on the y-axis, and the uh, and the color indicates how well the combination of protein force field and water force field reproduces the NMR chemical shifts for 500 different peptides. And as you can see, um, the force fields that are specifically parameterized to get these chemical shifts right do the best. Those are the ones in blue, um, whereas say FF96 combined with um, an implicit solvent model, GBSA, really doesn't do very well. Um, so these can be used to validate force fields, but my main point here is that they can also be used to optimize your force field. The, th the third step is to construct an objective function and apply an optimization method to minimize it. The objective function is a function of your force field parameters. Okay? Um, it might take very long to evaluate, um, but essentially, it's supposed to measure the disagreement between the reference data and the corresponding simulation result. So the better your force field, the smaller the objective function. And the optimization algorithm is going to be uh, a strategy for choosing different parameters to, uh, to go into the objective function. Because, uh, well, the main, the main point here is that you can't evaluate the objective function for every possible combination of parameters. Um, the objective function is probably a very complicated function. You're not going to know its global minimum. So rather, you need to apply numerical optimization algorithms to search for the minimum. If you have a very small number of parameters, like one or two, you can apply a grid scan, which really goes through the entire parameter space in some kind of finite domain. Um, but grid scans are not, are not feasible if you have large numbers of parameters, because the number of uh, grid points is exponential, right? You can also use um, derivative-based optimization algorithms in which you evaluate the objective function at an initial guess of your parameters, but you also evaluate its derivative. Um, optionally, you can also evaluate the second derivative, and that tells you the direction 
and also how far you should step. So if, so, if I'm, so if I'm currently here and I evaluate the derivative, it will tell me that if I go in this direction, the objective function will go down. The second derivative tells me that the surface will curve in this direction, so I will step in this direction. And as you can see, um, I will end up moving towards the minimum. The third method um, is using a stochastic or um, some say global optimization methods like simulated annealing or genetic algorithms. Um, these methods really um, are kind of like gu a guided random search. So, um, so simulated annealing essentially performs some kind of, it performs something like a Monte Carlo simulation or a molecular dynamic simulation, but in your parameter space. And the parameters are given random perturbations, but they also prefer to go where the objective function is low. So if you're really worried about um, derivative-based optimizations finding local minima, okay, you can apply these global methods to hop over barriers, but just uh, keep in mind that the number of objective function evaluations is generally higher using these stochastic methods. Okay, so these are the concepts, and I'll talk a little bit about my implementation. Um, I wrote a program called Force Balance to, um, to optimize force fields. Um, this is just a logo of the program, and if you're wondering, the Chinese character in the middle means balance, okay? Um, there's a direct interface with OpenMM, so if you like using OpenMM, force balance is very easy to use for parameterizing your force field. Um, it's highly flexible and easy, easily extensible and also freely available. If you go to simtk.org, which is the website you've been going to to get all of the downloads for this workshop, you can also go to uh, the force balance page where you can download the code. Um, here's kind of how the code is laid out. There are three main concepts that are, um, that are represented by classes. I was wondering, can you see it? Because it's kind of bright. You can see it? Okay. Um, so, I, so I mentioned that you want to pick a functional form that's mainly contained in the force field class. Um, the objective function class will, um, will basically evaluate this objective function, which is how well your force field is reproducing the reference data, and the optimizer will contain all the optimization algorithms that allow you to do your parameter search. And all of the, uh, um, and all of the specific types of force fields, um, reference data, and optimization methods are really just subclasses of these three main classes. Um, and there's a, and in addition, there's a lot of features in here that, um, that, that basically make this optimization problem, well, will basically make it easier for you to do the specific problem of force field optimization. Um, for example, well, force balance doesn't actually contain any equations to evaluate these interactions. Um, rather, it operates through interfaces to, um, to you know, mature and well-validated programs like OpenMM, Gromax, and, and so on. So all of the simulation results is actually getting from these programs, and it's reading in the reference data to construct the objective function, and then it applies these optimization methods to, um, to tune the parameters. Okay, so now for a simple application. Um, I talked about the amoeba force field um, yesterday, and that, and I, and I mentioned that it's a, that is one of the more accurate force fields that are out there. It's a polarizable force field, right? Um, and the, uh, and the foundation of any biomolecular force field is a good water model. Now, the amoeba water model was published in 2003, um, and it's still regarded as one of the most accurate water models out there. Um, however, it's very slow, right? And then, um, and one of the reasons why it's really slow is that it contains these things that are called mutually induced dipoles. It's because when it's because you have these polarizable dipoles, and imagine that every simulation step, your polarizable dipoles are going to feel the influence of the electric field from your static multipoles. Okay, so that means the polarizable dipoles show up, but once they show up, they start to influence each other. So the Precise values of the polarizable dipoles need to be solved um, self-consistently in many iterations at every simulation step. That's very costly. Um, and in fact, if you rewrite your equations in a funny way where the, um, where the polarizable dipoles don't interact with each other, okay, they, if they only interact with the static multipoles, then you don't need to do the self-consistent solution anymore. And that will reduce the computational cost by two times to five times, depending on the implementation. In OpenMM, it's five times faster. Okay. Um, in fact, you could just, um, there is an option for creating the system when um, you specify polarization direct, and then it will allow you to um, use the amoeba force field but without any interactions between polarizable dipoles. 
But the reason why I didn't talk about this is because if you set polarization direct, the equations become very different and the results get a lot worse. Um, if, you, if you take a look at the, uh, the simulated density of water using the amoeba force field, you see the red curve here. Um, you can see that around room temperature, 25 degrees Celsius, it's in, a, it's in good agreement with experiment and also at higher temperatures. But at lower temperatures, the disagreement is pretty big. Um, and, you, and in the inset, you also see that this is the enthalpy of vaporization of water with respect to temperature. Um, the, um, the amoeba force field gets the slope of the curve a little bit high, but at room temperature, the agreement is generally good. Now, if, we, now if you run polarization direct and you try to calculate the density and enthalpy of vaporization curves, everything is qualitatively wrong. You see, the density does not have a density maximum. It's well known that water has a density maximum around four degrees. Um, in this temperature range, the direct model does not have a density maximum. And furthermore, the enthalpy of vaporization is too low. You can also compare to some theoretical data. If you look at the, uh, if you run a bunch of calculations on little water clusters using the MP2 method, and you look at the scatter plot of energies, putting, say, if, if you put a quantum on the x-axis and the force field on the y-axis, the original amoeba force field, which is in the upper right, gives a pretty good agreement, whereas the polarization direct model um, gives an agreement that's significantly worse because the scatter is bigger. So this is a good application for us. There's uh, about 19 tunable parameters in, the, um, in this force field, and we want to see if we use polarization direct, is it possible to recover the accuracy of the original amoeba force field, which will give us um, a five times speed up and hopefully still give us a physically reasonable picture of the polarization. So this is what we get when we, after we run the optimization. So you see that there's a new blue curve on there. The blue curve is polarization direct, but we've applied force balance to optimize the parameters. Okay, and you can, and you can see that not only do we get the density of water correct around room temperature, but we also get the density to be correct within the entire temperature range and the temperature of maximum density is now in the right place. Um, the enthalpy of vaporization is also brought back into agreement with the original amoeba force field that used to be too low way down here. Now it's up here. The slope is still a little bit high. Um, and you can see where, um, where before polarization direct had a large scatter um, with respect to the quantum energies and forces, um, now, uh, now the scatter is better. And well, these are the properties that we fitted to. And, um, and you say, well, um, well, it's obvious that if you do curve fitting, I mean, this is really glorified curve fitting, right? Um, that the results are going to be better. And the true test of the force field is whether, um, is whether it can predict properties that were not in the objective function. And, that's, uh, and I think that's completely correct. So when we run some, um, we run some simulations of other properties that we did not include in our objective function, we also find the results to be quite good, like the, diff like the diffusion constant is closer to experiment than the original amoeba, the dielectric constant is still in the right place, and the temperature of maximum density, which we technically didn't fit to directly, is also at a good number. And if you look at the radial distribution function of two oxygen atoms in liquid water, it's also pretty close to the experiment. So we do think that using force balance, we created a good water force field that's competitive with the best ones that are out there. So how is force balance integrated with OpenMM? Um, in another one of these little diagrams, I seem to enjoy creating these. Um, the blue diamonds represent things co like concepts that are within force balance, and the yellow uh, corresponds to things that are inside OpenMM. And because force balance is entirely written in Python, it integrates pretty seamlessly with OpenMM. Basically, uh, whenever um, whenever I want to use OpenMM to evaluate, say, the energy and the force for a particular configuration, or if I want it to simulate an ensemble average property, which then goes into my objective function, I create the system, execute the simulation, save the data, and then it comes back into the objective function. It's very simple, and it's very natural. And um, in fact, OpenMM has been very helpful for bringing force balance to where it currently is. Um, now, I don't have a demo for force balance, even though I, I could have technically had one, but, um, but I'm going to uh, mention briefly how you would use it if you wanted to use it. Um, the parameters to be optimized are specified by labeling the force field XML file. So if you came to my breakout session yesterday, you know that the, you know that the force field XML file specifies all the interactions that, um, that you have when you set up your system. 
And for example, this clause is the amoeba harmonic bond force, which is really just a harmonic interaction between two atoms with some anharmonic corrections. And what I've done in the XML element is to add an attribute, parametrize equals length comma k. And when you, and the force balance will read this attribute, OpenMM doesn't touch it. And, and it knows that this number is the number that needs to be optimized, and this number needs to be optimized. So as force balance runs, it will write new XML files with these numbers replaced by the optimized values. At each optimization step, you'll write new parameter files, and there are several force field formats that are supported, for example, the Gromax ITP format and, and so on, but it's really most natural to do this in, um, in OpenMM. Another thing that you might find nifty is that, well, you often don't want parameters to be completely independent variables. Like, for example, I don't want to optimize all the charges because they might not add up to zero anymore, right? Um, so you can, actually, um, you can actually write XML in such a way that any force field parameter here is an arbitrary mathematical function of an independent parameter. So, um, so it's really quite versatile and, um, and hopefully written in such a way that is, uh, that is natural for general force field optimization problems and not just mine. Um, this is a force balance input file. Um, it's a, I've modeled it after the QChem input file because I've used QChem, the quantum chemistry program, a lot. Um, but, but you can see there's basically, a set, um, there's basically a global option section that specifies options for the force field and for the optimization algorithm. And for the different components of your objective function, well, every component of the objective function is a simulation and a corresponding set of reference data. And so every one of those gets a, um, gets a clause like this. So this is, a, this is an example input file. The real input file might be longer because force balance does have many options. Um, I have an instruction manual and a doxygen page that you, can, that you can consult to get information on all of the options just by um, going to the SimTK project page. Um, unlike OpenMM, um, I guess a force balance is not designed to be um, to be a library that you import modules from and do anything in. Um, maybe in the future it could be like that. But for now, we just have a script called forcebalance.py that you just run and it does what you want. So, um, so you run the script, it does, it does the optimization. I mean, if you, if you want, you could probably like load the various libraries to do various things, but this kind of ties all of it together. Um, furthermore, because optimizations are often multi day tasks and you might want to tweak it and restart, you can really paste sections of the output back into the input and it will pick up where you left off. Okay, um, uh, one last little detail of, um, of things we put into force balance is that we put very strict regularization. Um, now regularization means that you don't allow your optimization to go too far because your objective function is not going to be a complete description of reality, right? It's only going to contain certain parts of your reference data, and it's possible to overfit it. If you overfit it, then you end up with unphysical parameter values, and then when you go off to simulate something that wasn't in your objective function, then you do horribly. Um, so, so the way we take care of that is really, um, is really very simple. You add a penalty function onto your original objective function, that makes sure that makes sure your parameters don't go too far away from where you started them from. So you start them from some physically reasonable guess, and the idea is that your optimization won't move too far from there. Although the precise value of your initial guess is not going to be so important, it's just important that they're physically reasonable. The blue line you see here might be the original objective function, and if I fit it, um, I might I might find the parameter ends up here, and who knows? This might be a um, this might be the angle of a bond, and, and I've ended up with the angle of the bond being 15 degrees smaller. That might be unphysical, right? Um, in that case, you might want to add a penalty function, which actually has a strict correspondence in a, a Bayesian probability theory. If you, uh, if you just put a parabola on the objective function, that's called a Gaussian prior, and that means that when you do the optimization, your parameter is not going to move so far, okay? Um, you can also apply something called a Laplacian prior, which is uh, um, which, um, where you basically add the absolute value of the parameter, and not the and not like the parameter squared onto the objective function. And the unique feature of using a Laplacian prior 
is that some parameters are not going to change at all while other parameters are optimized. And you don't need to, uh, you don't need to specify which ones, which parameters don't change and which ones change. The algorithm kind of picks them out for you. Okay, so, um, so, we, so we hope that force balance will allow force field optimization to be more systematic. Um, so it, it might, like we, um, if you use this method, you don't need to choose parameters by hand anymore. However, that's, that's not to say that this program is a replacement for scientific decision making, because we all make decisions that go into the force field. It's just that we're not picking the precise values of the parameters. Rather, we are choosing what types of data go into our objective function and how much the parameters are allowed to vary. So the scientific decision making is done at a much higher, and I would also venture to say more scientific level. And furthermore, because, um, well, because this program really allows you to optimize a force field in a way that's similar to running a molecular mechanics simulation. So instead of a year-long project that's very, um, th that's not reproducible because you're doing, you know, a very, uh, like a various co collection of things, here you just write an input file, you set up the calculation, and you run it. And that might improve the reproducibility of force field development. And furthermore, because, uh, um, because every force balance calculation is kind of self-contained, it contains all of the it contains all of the reference data and optimization algorithms. Um, we hope that this would give everybody the infrastructure for making good force fields. Um, for example, if you have uncommon molecules like not mainstream, not a protein. So if you're so if you're a so if you're a hipster, basically, you know there might not be a force field that is optimized for you. Um, and you can use this method to improve the accuracy of your simulation, where force field development efforts are relatively sparse. Um, and um, force balance is all inclusive in the sense that it's really easy to write interfaces with, with any simulation software. Because if I, I knew that if I wanted this software to be general, it has to interface with, um, with anyone's, anybody's simulation software of choice. So interfaces are very easy to write. They're a little bit like plugins. Um, and in general, it reduces the headache of force field development and allows us to focus on the science. Um, so I'd be happy to talk to you, um, talk to you more about this later, but, um, but thank you. <laughs>